Hi, everyone. I'm Gold Derby News and Features Editor Ray Richmond, and I'm here today with Melissa Moore, executive producer of the six hour lifetime documentary series, The Prison Confessions of Gypsy Rose Blanchard. Uh, the series features prison interviews with the uh, now paroled Blanchard, now 32, a victim of Munchausen syndrome by proxy. Uh, Melissa, tell us briefly, if you would, the crux of Gypsy's harrowing story and how she was victimized by her mother. Over the entire course of her life, she was groomed to be a victim of her mother in the presentation of this grand con, which is presenting her as a victim of cancer and multiple other ailments. Uh, Gypsy endured having her salivatory glands removed. She had a feeding tube. She wasn't allowed to have food. Her mother got her addicted to opiates. Um, and then also restrained her from seeking freedom. And she actually had convinced family and friends and outsiders that Gypsy could not walk. So basically her mother imprisoned her and Gypsy said it best, it was a kill or be killed situation of the imprisonment she faced. It's just unfathomable that yeah. this could happen over a number of years and that a human being could do this to another one. Um, how and when, uh, Moisa, did you meet and become involved with Gypsy? It was about seven years ago after Aaron Lee Carr's incredible documentary on HBO, Mommy Dead and Dearest. And I remember watching that and being completely fascinated by Gypsy's case. And that was at the... Aaron did a great job of showing the beginning of Gypsy's story. And so I went to Chillicothe, the prison, to meet with Gypsy, and I asked her if I could do a, an interview for, at the time I was working for a daytime talk show and she declined the interview, but we had a fabulous conversation. Um, during that conversation, we started talking about her hopes for her future. She also said something very haunting to me, which is when she arrived at prison, it was the freest she ever felt that she gave this story to me of how she was in the prison yards and for the first time she felt free. And I thought, this is a woman who is coming of age in prison. Um, if you, when you watch the documentary, you'll learn that fellow inmates, female inmates taught her about what it is like to be a woman, about love, relationships, feminine hygiene, everything, relationships, sex, everything she learned in prison. I guess that speaks volumes, doesn't it? That for the first time in your life, it takes prison for you to feel free. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, the irony of that. I, do you believe that her 10-year uh, prison sentence for second degree murder, of, of which I think she served eight and a half years? Correct, um, yeah. W w was, was that just? I personally don't believe so. And I know everybody has a different opinion. I know she. some people view her as, a killer. Some people view her as a victim and she's a combination of both. I think her situation was very complex. She was failed multiple ways. I believe she was failed through the education system. Um, she was homeschooled or, <clears throat> excuse me, or thought to be homeschooled and nobody checked up on her. Uh, CPS did come to the house one time, but Gypsy will tell you, didn't ask the right questions. Um, and then also the medical field that the system was there that failed her too. Why was nothing done to stop Dee Dee uh, from abusing her daughter? I mean, I guess yeah. she just, she played it right when she, when, when there were officials around or when questions were being asked, I guess she, she managed to, uh, uh, you know, fake it well enough. So it appeared to be a normal situation. Well, she had the mask of a loving mother and nobody wants to question a loving mother. We always think mother knows best. And I think as a society, that's what we believe. And so even if we have intuition or doubts, she preyed upon that. And so I believe that's how she got away with it. The logistics uh, for producing this documentary series, Melissa, must have been incredibly tricky. Uh, yeah. What sort of hurdles did you encounter with the prison system in making it? Well, uh, I was fortunate that a great relationship with the prison. I actually, the whole docu series was filmed only, I think, three interviews in prison, but most of them were done over the phone between Gypsy and I. 
Hence why you see a lot of the recreations because they were phone interviews. There's no visual aspect to some of these interviews, especially like when she got the phone call that she's being, you know, paroled. Um, a lot of this happened where we can't in real time capture it with camera. So that was tricky, but we did three long sit downs with her. I, I myself for the first two and some producers for the second, I mean, for the third. Did they, did the president put limitations on the amount of minutes say that you were allowed to visit yeah. each time? Yeah. So we had an hour to set up um, and we had, we had restrictions on what we could bring and how big our crew could be. So we had a max of five individuals that could be there. We couldn't bring our phones. We couldn't bring any technology in. There was one time that I um, accidentally forgot my Apple watch. <laughs> and I mean, it's, it's hairy because you get really scared that, you know, that when I missed my Apple watch, I thought, oh my gosh, they could shut us down immediately now for this interview because of one slip up. But basically an hour to set up um, we were confined to the visiting the visiting room where all inmates met with their family members, and there was only a certain amount of days that we could have access to that. And then behind me, when I was doing the interviews, we had all the vending machines that were noisy <laughs> and running. <laughs> so we had that as an issue. But uh, yeah, just an hour interview is all we got each time. Yeah, they're not thinking of well, what, gee, what's going to sound the best or look the best on camera when you're in a prison? They're just like, you know, okay, let them do their thing and then let's get them the hell out. So, um, but yeah. why wouldn't they let you bring your phone in? Or why wouldn't they, why wasn't technology allowed? Is it, did, did they feel like you were going to slip them something that they could keep and hide? I don't know. It's just their, the prison policy. And each prison, I've worked with several prisons, and each prison is different on what you can bring. But um, even going in, I, I could bring some paper, but I had to ask the guard for a pen. It's just about, I think it's about um, transferring anything or showing, I don't know. It's just, it's hard to say, but I'm sure there's a legitimate reason on their end. Did it take a while to gain Gypsy's trust and to warm her up and you know draw her out um or was it pretty did she uh did she warm up and start talking and and you know discussing her past pretty pretty close to immediately well gypsy and i have a unique connection. So my father is serving multiple life sentences in prison. And so I have an understanding of complicated grief. So instantly I know for Gypsy that her familial love for her mother, even though she murdered her mother or had her mother murdered, was still there. So I understood some of her complicated feelings. Um, how, how it started our relationship was that um, I was working for a daytime talk show. I went there to ask for an interview seven years ago. And then she said, no, which is fine. We had that great conversation, but we stayed in touch. And then it was about three years ago that we finally, uh, we finally had the discussion, like, maybe this is time, you know, we can show the world your true story. She was very frustrated that everybody was telling her story, but her. Why do, you, why do you think she said no years before, before she finally agreed? I think it was the fact that she had just done Mommy Dead and Dearest with Aaron Carr, and she felt like at that point her story was told. But over the course of the, those seven years, it really, her story was still evolving. And, and she recognized that. And then she started to realize that there was still... She wasn't ready to to tell the total truth to her own parents. So there was a lot of secrets she had kept away from her her stepmother and her father that she was ashamed to share that she shares in the docuseries. One of those things is that she became addicted to pain medication and how her mom leveraged that addiction to keep her hostage. Um, there's that element. And then also just the shame, too, uh, of the, the crime that she committed still lingered with her and um, the belief that she wasn't worthy. That is one of the things that she talked about that we discussed in the docuseries is that she told me the story about the cow, the cow tongue and the curse and how she believed in the curse that her mother set on her, that she'll never find true love. Um, and that belief, and I understand what it's like when you, you absorb a belief it becomes your reality, whether it's true or not. So that that curse 
could be hocus pocus. It could be completely fake, but to her, it was real. And so she still had to unravel the truth about what she's worthy of. And that's the residue that she carried with, from her mom's abuse. It was a mental residue. And again, she, she did not personally kill her mother. It was a, right. a, bo a boyfriend that she put up to the task. Right. And um, and he's still served, he's still in prison. Correct. Yes. Um, you'd mentioned your own trauma, Melissa, uh, in having a father serving time in prison. What was was his crime, murder, and how did that impact you? Yeah. So in '95, I was 16 when my father, when I discovered my father was living a double life. He was arrested for serial murder, and one thing that serial meaning several murders. Correct. He was known as the happy face serial killer. And wow. yeah, and that uh, as a 16 year old, I had to reconcile this massive betrayal in my life and to come to terms with who was my father, this double life. And also one thing that I faced is the media. So after my father's arrest, everybody was telling a narrative about my family, about my father. And Parts of it were true, but not all of it. And so I understood Gypsy's position of what it's like when everybody takes the stage and tells the story that you lived, you know, and so I wanted to give her that I want to empower her to to tell her own story because I have since found it very empowering for myself to share my own story so that I could connect with other survivors. And I know that's what Gypsy's mission is going to be is advocacy and connecting with other survivors. Did it ever uh, complicate things for you, Melissa, to wear both friend and producer hats when you were working with her? I mean, was it was it ever, you know, you're taking her into, into her, your confidence and, you know, and did she ever feel like, oh, I'm revealing too much and this could wind up in her betraying me, too? Yeah, there's a there's a fear in that. Um Really, I, I feel like where some boundaries were, where we hit some crossroads was when she decided she was going to get married. And and I had all this perspective of being out in the world and dealing with healing from my own trauma. And I knew just I had been married at that point for 18 years and I knew how hard it was for me to unpack my past. So I knew the battle that Gypsy was going to face. And she this relationship started in prison and with, with her husband, Ryan, that we follow in the docuseries um, and I just saw all the hurdles and I really wanted Gypsy to enter the world as a free woman without any entanglements or anything weighing on her that she can make her own decisions and be free for the first time without consideration for a partner and be, you know, I guess selfish for the first time. So I wanted that for her. And so I found myself wanting to persuade her to not get married. And that's where I felt like I was crossing the line from friend and producer, because as a producer, I shouldn't have any influence on her decision in her life. But also her parents actually gave me really great advice. They're like, her mother controlled her entire life. We have to let Gypsy, whether we like it or not, make her own decisions. And that's her freedom is choice. And let's let her have that, even though it might End up Even if you see it a mile away that, oh, God, this is a mistake. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. And then she yeah. does it. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. And, you know, along those same lines, Melissa, we see that uh, she's just recently filed for divorce and a temporary restraining order against her husband, who I guess she married in prison in 2022. Mm -hmm. um, how sad that it's come to that. It is. Um, it is sad. And we 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 are following her still as she when she was released from prison on December 28th we kept filming with her so the world will see how she her first hours of being a free woman her choices and then as she starts to come into this world as a free woman for the first time her choices and also her environment and i think it's going to be very revealing because she's so open and she's honest, like every time, um, I, I mean, there's a moment, well, I, I guess I can't share everything, but one thing that she did tell me is that there's a moment that she chose to share, which is when she removes her dentures and she, she shows the aftermath of 
of all of these surgeries that her mother inflicted on her. And so there's still more to unpack with her story. And you'll see that in the in the follow-up doc. Oh, I was going to say, so there is a follow-up doc in the works right now. Yeah, Gypsy Rose, Life After Lockup. When do we think that will be coming? It should be, be um, announced soon. I don't actually know the, the date yet. But, you know, so this is a 32-year-old woman, but in terms of her maturity and her life experience, she may be closer to it, to an adolescent yeah. um, still. So that's obviously what you're dealing with. Um, uh, we find out in, in the, this book that you worked on, an ebook uh, with her, that she spent two weeks in solitary confinement resulting from a social media mm-hmm. post by a stranger who talked about trying to bust her out of prison. Yikes. <laughs> yeah. um, how did that all come? Well, we, so um, creating this docu-series, we did a phone call every Tuesday and we would do like every phone call would last 15 minutes and the prison had an automated service and it would cut the the phone call off and it would time the phone calls. And so we did about 30 minutes to 45 minutes um, every Tuesday. And all of a sudden out of nowhere, I didn't receive any phone calls and I would send her messages and nothing. And that's not like Gypsy to not respond. And then I find out that um, she was in solitary confinement for this post, but she didn't know at the beginning why she was in this confinement. And then the the hell that endured. I mean, to me, when she told me what she endured, I I found it to be incredibly traumatic um, that she had very little visibility to light, that she was roomed with, um, a cellmate that was heavily um, drugged and how she made the, like, like Gypsy does, she has this incredible imagination that helps her survive and how she came up with games and things to do to pass the time away. Of course, she's wondering, because she's on the verge of, of her parole and wondering if she is going to make her parole. If that's that, going to blow the parole, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. my God. Like the like the woman hasn't been through enough. Yeah. Um, what was the most rewarding part about working with her on this, uh, Melissa? So many. Um, I had the opportunity to watch her come of age and really become a strong, independent female woman. Uh, one thing that I observed in her growth and healing is that she started to make decisions based on her intuition versus what other people wanted for her. And that was one of the biggest rewards is still watching her navigate life with her own compass. How was the uh, the series received when it originally showed on Lifetime in January? Was it, was it a... a kind of, I think it was kind of a sensation, wasn't it? Yeah, I was um, surprised. I think it was 9.9 million views uh, and even more, the most downloaded IP for Lifetime for them. Um, it's exceeded any of our expectations. What did Gypsy think of the six hours? Was she, was she, um, happy with it? Were there things she wanted to change? Did she feel disappointed at all? Or was she pretty much fully satisfied? She was incredibly happy. And she will tell you that one of the things that she told me is that she learned a lot watching it because when she's in prison, she's, you know, isolated from the people that handled her case. So hearing some of her medical, uh, hearing about some of her medical documents and the drugs, like that was revealing to her. She started to have an understanding that the drugs that she was on actually had an influence on her personality and her uh, affect. And so she's starting to put it all together, but some of the pieces of the puzzle were revealed to her for the first time in her own documentary. That's just unbelievable. Wow. Well, we're going to actually leave things there, Melissa. The six-part The Prison Confessions of Gypsy Rose Blanchard is available to stream over Lifetime's app and via numerous other streaming platforms. Uh, Melissa Moore, best of luck to you this Emmy season. And uh, thanks for joining us today at Gold Derby. Thank you. 